And I'll bring up one more, the DEA and the law enforcement, right? What's their role? Let's say, for instance, a miracle happens and we just absolutely stop all the drugs coming into the country, which we've wanted to do for a long time. What do we do then? Okay, we reached our outcome. We stopped the drugs, right? Yep. What do we do with all the people now that the millions of people that have a substance use disorder, what do we do? So we need the DEA, we need criminal justice, we need first responders, we need law enforcement, we need public health, we need housing, employment. All of the folks within an ecosystem to working together to think through a system's lens and get outcomes for the entire system. Dr. Jennifer Loeffler Cobia, and I am the Director of Justice and Public Health Policy and Practice at West Ed's Justice and Prevention Center, and you are listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast. From PHI Media, I'm Gordon Thane, and this is the story of the opioid crisis, episode 216 Policies Gone Wrong and the Power of Systems Thinking. You're listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast, your go to space for all things public health and global health, from the sustainable development goals to the social determinants of health, as well as interesting dialogues about the diverse career opportunities that exist in these fields. Remember to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify so other people like you can benefit from our content. Last time, we talked about how the modern opioid crisis evolved over time through the prism of the three waves from Oxycontin to heroin, and then to fentanyl. The natural progression in that discussion leads to one of solutions and ideas for a better future. What you're about to hear is the final chapter in our conversation with Dr. Jennifer Loeffler Cobia, is the impact of slowly evolving policies on the worsening opioid crisis, the value of adopting a systems thinking approach with a variety of stakeholders, And we finish off with a captivating story, which reminds us that there is a story behind every single statistic. At one point, the bad guy in the opioid crisis was clear. It was Purdue and the rest of Big Pharma and maybe even the regulators who didn't do enough at the time. Some would even say it was the physicians for accepting incentives to prescribe the drug. Fast forward and we're now in the fourth wave of the opioid crisis where the picture is much more messy. Big Pharma is now making the antidotes to the overdoses and treatment for addiction, where drug traffickers are the major supplier of drugs on the street and those drugs are often tainted. Now government drug policies are lagging behind the present day challenges and making it worse. So I pose the question, when did the policies officially become the bad guy? Yeah, I love I love this. I love this topic. I can't put my finger on just like when you're saying when mm-hmm. did the policies, you know, become the in quotes bad guy. But over the last I want to say 5 10 years, we've really under- got a better understanding of how the current policies were affecting the process, hindering what we can and can't do, right? In in uh, like medical assisted treatment what we can and can't do with the drugs coming into the country. And I'm not just talking about the southern border, I'm talking of the northern border, I'm talking about from other countries through planes. It's coming in at all directions, right? And so I think we have gotten a better understanding in the last, especially in the last few years, of how important it is to have good drug policies that are bipartisan and enforcing the laws that we have. Right. And I think that's where we've gotten away from it. And probably one of the things that if you asked me what keeps me up Mm. at night, (laughs) one of the things that keeps me up at night in terms of this epidemic is the policy and is the lack of implementation of not only laws uh, that we have on the book, but reforming the laws and then implementing them appropriately and doing that together. And having the conversations, the grown-up conversations, right. <laughs> if you will, to listen to each other, hmm. right? To work together and not fight each other. Because when we do that, you see what we get. But I will tell you with recently, just in 2023, the Mainstream Addiction Act just came out 
where it really changed the way that we as practitioners can use and implement medical assisted treatment. So buprenorphine, naltrexone, methadone, because there were such, our hands were tied in terms of being able to distribute and prescribe those drugs that are used to, that are effective, and it's really the gold mm -hmm. standard in treatment to bring down the withdrawal symptoms and getting the folks through the withdrawal before that then they can do the treatment for the substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. Physicians were not able to prescribe without waivers right. from the DEA and others to be able to prescribe those. And now with this new MAT Act of 23, that reduces that, or that takes that waiver away. And so physicians are now able to prescribe, prescribe these treatments. But that was just wow. this past year, right? So we have been battling medical assisted treatment for years and years and years when we know that it's been effective in treatment and recovery. And so that's one example of policy, right? We still have so much yeah. more work to do in policy. You got me started, yeah. Gordon, <laughs> right? Systems thinking. We need, we need funding, we need policies to say, how can we bring system leaders together, housing, mm. workforce, public health, m mental health, who am I missing, first responders, policymakers, everyone that works in that ecosystem, bring those leaders together and start working through processes and practices that actually work. It's hard work to do and it's expensive. We need policy and funding to be able to start bringing folks together to be able to work as a system. Let's park the systems thinking tangent for just a little while longer. It is important and we'll indeed get into it. For the sake of the conversation, I pose the question, if policies were the bad guy, and if so, when did it become like this? Perhaps the bigger question that I wasn't taking into account is why isn't more being done to address the crisis and help those most affected by it? I don't know if I answered your question, Gordon, because I kind of went off That's, on a tangent. We want, but... we want the tangent. So let's stay on that tangent for a bit. In hearing you talk, I'm thinking, okay, you got the physician prescribed opioids, then we got the street supply, then we got people using the street supply, then we get available medical technology that's being underutilized. And then it almost feels like the policy became exposed because things were moving rapidly. So the policies existed and we didn't realized that they were so archaic till we really needed to implement things and realized that we couldn't. Right. So the examples that come to mind here as well is you, you talked about medical assisted treatment, supervised consumption, which can be quite controversial, safe supply, which is quite controversial. And like I know Canada maybe is a little bit more progressive when it comes right. to those things. And then in the U.S. maybe not so much. So it, it shows that there's a bit of a disconnect there. But one of the things that LaShawn and I talked about, too, and one of our, because it's a topic that we talk about quite a bit in our podcast, mm -hmm. is around what is the hesitation, and it's a tough question to ask, but it should be asked, the hesitation about addressing these things more progressively. Is it that the role of stigma? So people who use mm -hmm. drugs, yep. they're a certain way, and yeah, if, if you right. only just didn't use it, you wouldn't be in this position. Why are we going to divert resources away from other things when everything's all your fault? Mm -hmm. I feel right. like there's been an undertone, and I don't want to put words in your mouth necessarily here, but for me, there's been a bit of an undertone of that with the reluctance to maybe go a little bit more all in on mm -hmm. what should be done versus other social issues that are a little bit less controversial and more socially acceptable for us to support. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, Gordon, I'm going to answer this in a public health yes, framework. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> okay. So, yes, you, you brought up stigma. We've always thought, okay, yep, oh, they're a drug mm. user. They're an addict, right? It's their fault that they're, that they're doing this. They did this to themselves. But as public health professionals, one of the things we learn, Public Health 101, is messaging. How do we a message for whatever ailment it is or whatever it is that's affecting a population, how do we message appropriately to educate our communities, our families, individuals, and policymakers, right? And we've done a poor job of that, of messaging, right? And we need to do a better job to say, what is a substance use mm. disorder? Rather than showing the picture, and I've seen billboards like this, rather than showing the picture of the addict 
you know, where, you know, maybe a right. method where they, you know, imaging. scratch themselves, yeah. stereotypical, right? Um, and then next to it saying, oh, but they got treatment and now look at them. They're, they're right. beautiful, right? Oh, poor message, okay? So we need to do better, number one, at messaging of what is this disease, yeah. right? This disease. is a disease. Mm -hmm. It's a disorder. It's, a, it's not a, you're not an addict. You are someone with a substance use disorder, just like you're someone with diabetes or you're someone with, with cardiovascular disease. It is a disorder. And we have medications and practices and, and processes that can help with treatment. Some of those are harm reduction. I'm not going to say that harm reduction is a treatment, but it reduces harm of overdose. We have medical assisted treatment, right? And we have cognitive behavioral therapies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To help with, with the disorder. And I think that, that that's one area that we've done a really poor job in is, is messaging about this, right? Because then it, if we can do better at that, we can then kind of have a philosophical shift, if you will, in terms of how we think about substance use disorders, how we think about addiction, how we think about treatment and recovery. Okay, now back to systems thinking. There are multiple layers to the opioid crisis, which calls for a variety of skill sets and influences. Everything from the criminal justice side to the healthcare side to social services and many more. Without a coordinated approach, the crisis will persist with little improvements. This is where Westad's Justice and Prevention Research Center comes in, and they work with opioid prevention and treatment coalitions, as well as task forces across the United States to build their capacity for assessing their readiness and shaping strategic plans to address the opioid crisis in a more comprehensive way. The JPRC, as they're known in short, has helped these groups use their own data to gain an understanding of their current resources, challenges, as well as the strategies that they can use to overcome these barriers. This is a perfect segue, as you mentioned, thinking about things in a systems thinking approach, a public health framework, to really talk more about your role now as a director of justice and public health policy and practice at West Ed Justice and Prevention Research Center. So tell us about what, what's some of the work that mm -hmm. Westhead's involved with, maybe specifically your team. Obviously, yep. some of it's been sprinkled out through the conversation, but maybe, you know, yeah. paint some light into what that looks like. So I want to I bring up a piece of research, and I can get it to you if you all want to read it. But it's a piece of research that was done, oh, I think it was back 2018, 2019. And a team of researchers looked at the prediction of, and this is, I just am telling you this because this is how I really got into maybe thinking more about systems thinking. But they did a prediction study of, so this is five, six years ago, to say, hey, in five years, 2025, this is what the trajectory, if we mm. stay on the current path of policy right. and practice, so siloed approaches, PDMP, mm. that prescription drug monitoring program, harm reduction, criminal justice, right? If we just stay on this kind of siloed approach of looking at outcomes and, and implementing practices, we are going to see a hundred and close to 150% increase in overdose deaths by 2025. By 2025? Like yeah, so this was this was a study. Yeah. When you, was you that? Say it, when, Gordon. <laughs> sorry, I'm like a little shocked. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah. I thought you were going to say in, the, in like in 10 years or something. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. This was a study done in 2019 oh at the current at the current situation wow. then. So we're 2024. I know when I said 2025, you're, I saw your face. It was like, wait, that's like <laughs> that's tomorrow in a few months. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My point. So we we have sadly made this prediction come true, mm. right? Because you talked about you know kind of the different the big pharma, the, the policies, you know, enforcing the laws, all of the things that kind of have contributed to where we are at today, this prediction study has come true. And I, I don't see in the next few months that we're going to just have a, a major decrease trajectory in overdoses. And so this study has always just been in the mm -hmm. back of my head, thinking we've got to make changes in the way that we think about this epidemic, right? And this can be in, in anything we do. I mean, this can be in what community safety. It can be in how we address HIV. It can be whatever kind of 
ailment or issue that's affecting populations, we can think through a systems lens, right? But this study is what has been just, just I've been grappling over your head. with for yeah. yeah for years because it's coming mm. true. And so what I did, and you mentioned that I recently worked on my doctorate. So in my residency, in the work that I did on my residency, was I looked at what what are the barriers? Why are people not? Why are we not doing systems right, thinking? Right. Why are we not collaborating? Why are we not coming together? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example. When we look at just PDMP, they reach their outcomes. Right, we got right. good outcomes, right? We reduced prescriptions, right. right? But And I mentioned this before. What happened? Well, those folks had to find their addiction somewhere. They've got a disorder now, so they've got to go to the streets, right? So then we just produced more criminal mm. activity, people getting arrested and putting people into the criminal justice system, whether through prisons and, and our jails, right? Well, then what's the purpose of prisons and jails? Right. It's to incarcerate, right? It's to keep folks from reducing recidivism. Hopefully, while they're incarcerated, they're not right. using, right. right? Which we know right. is not true, <laughs> but, you know, ideally. But we are there to incarcerate and then release, okay? If we're not then putting... And we're reaching outcomes while they're incarcerated. We're not re we're not committing crimes, hopefully, right? But what happens then when they're released? If they didn't get treatment through medical assisted treatment, what happens when they're mm. released? Yeah. It's a cycle. They come back, right? They go out. They didn't get the treatment they needed for their substance use disorder. Then we have this revolving door of coming back. And same is true if we just look at the lens of harm reduction. What's the goal of harm reduction? The goal of harm reduction is to reduce harm, right? Syringe programs, syringe exchange programs, Narcan, right? We, we are reducing that overdose or that harm to themselves, but what are we prol proliferating? Mm -hmm. Housing issues, right? Employment issues. I mean, you, you see the housing crisis, right? The, those that are unhoused and the population that we've seen grow there. It's just this constant cycle of working in silos, getting our siloed outcomes of organizationally, but not as a system, right? And I'll bring up one more, the DEA and the law enforcement, right? What's their role? Let's say, for instance, a miracle happens and we just absolutely stop all the drugs coming into the country, which we've wanted to do for a long time. What do we do then? Okay, we reached our outcome. We stopped mm -hmm. the drugs, right? Yep. What do we do with all the people mm -hmm. now that the millions of people that have a substance use disorder, what do we do? Right? So we need the DEA, we need criminal justice, we need first responders, we need law enforcement, we need public health, we need housing, employment. All of the folks within an ecosystem to working together to think through a system's lens and get outcomes for the entire system. System thinking approaches are required to solve complex problems indeed. The first step to addressing the problem is to be on the same page. As a famous American philosopher once said, a problem well defined is a problem half solved. But what does it take to successfully define the problem and do what's necessary to address it? So I like the piece there about what you said where I think there's no silver bullet. There's no one thing that we could do to address this. But I think it's kind of along the lines of messaging, there's a misconception. Oh, you did this and it didn't work. But like... Within right. this, there's like a hundred problems and each thing solves like sort of one problem. So you talked about the overprescribing. Right. There was a solution about the system and making sure it providers thing and it can get flagged across different pharmacies. So we can catch counterfeit prescriptions and all that stuff. Yeah. And then there's sort of the, all right, so if you stop illegal drugs from coming in the country, what happens to the people that are already addicted? Does it come from somewhere right. else? So you have to address, address all those problems simultaneously in a bit of a system like what you're talking about. Is there a gold standard for a jurisdiction or a country or someone that's mm -hmm. kind of getting the systems thinking approach right? I wish I could say Oh, yes. no. <laughs> <laughs> I know, because we, we're new at this, right. you guys. I mean, we're new at this. Policies and practice have not allowed us to have the funding and the resources to truly do systems thinking. And a part of my residency work was to dive into, well, okay, 
if we know there is some research out there that says, hey, if we do more collaborative work, we think through outcomes at a systems lens, we do produce better outcomes. But there are so, so why would we not do this? And so what I looked at is what are the barriers to a systems thinking approach? So then we can use that information to create better policy and practice. And a lot of the barriers were things that you would, are not rocket science or brain surgery, <laughs> funding, resources, the lack of motivation to work together, right? The ability to try new things, champions for the process. We don't have enough champions mm -hmm. to say, hey, let's come together, let's work together, right? We all get comfortable working in our own little mm -hmm. bucket, <laughs> right? We don't, wanna, we don't wanna get out of that. So we need more champions for the process. We need more uh, resources to be able to look at a system and say, what resources do we have in our system? Where are the duplications in resources? Where are we duplicating efforts where we're wasting resources? And where can we take that and reallocate resources, right? To be able to work better together in this ecosystem. And there were so many, there were numerous barriers that were, that I found that said, okay, this is why we're not doing this. So what I did is, and what we do with my team here at Westead, is I developed a readiness implementation tool that a coalition, and LaShawn, I know you talked about coalitions that you've been, you've worked on, and Gordon, you as well. But when we all sit down together, what's the first thing that we do? We look at each other and we're like, okay, what do we do next? Who's in charge, <laughs> right? Because we all know that we need to do something. And we all know that we need to reduce ov overdoses, right? And we need to reduce deaths. Well, are we ready to work together to actually do that? And so I've created a tool that, it, and it's literally an, an assessment tool that you go through as a system. You bring the leaders together within the coalition so that the, all of those folks I mentioned in an ecosystem. And you go through the tool and you think through, okay, where's our motivation? right, to actually work together? Do we have the buy-in, right? Do we have the ability to pilot? Do we, is it simple to do, right? We have to go through and say, hey, can we actually do this, right? Do we, are we motivated to, to work together as a system? Do we have the specific skill set to do it? Do we have the specific capacity to do this? Do we have the right folks at the table? Do we have the right vo voices? Do we have the right skills to do this? And we really look at this as a system. Do we have the capacity to do this? And do we have the motivation to do this? And you go through this and you give yourself a score, right? Through, as a coalition. And then it helps with strategic planning to say, okay, we know what we're doing well now as a system, but where do we need to get to? Where do we need to improve, right? And you can build out strategic plans from there to start thinking about this epidemic as a system and addressing it as a system. And you absolutely have to have policymakers at the table with you, and you absolutely have to have those that have been impacted, that have gone through the system, whether it's criminal justice, mental health treatment, right? Those that have had a substance use disorder or are currently working through it at the table, mm -hmm. right? What better people to understand what works and doesn't work than those that have actually been impacted, right? right? So it's a tool that really helps coalitions and workforce tasks, task forces really think through, are we ready to do this before we just jump in and, and start doing things that don't work? That's amazing. And it sounds like I'm envisioning to how I might have used such a tool. And mm. it almost could be an evaluative type tool too. So in, on the onset, Absolutely. you could, we are going, to, we're looking to start a coalition and this is a useful tool to give you ideas of what you need to start. And it's also a good tool to use. Like we've been doing this for a while how do we give ourselves a self-assessment? Exactly. And it kind of serves that purpose it, as well, like a bit of a scorecard, yep. if you will. There. Yep, it is. And it, it's definitely a dynamic process. And guys, we're not going to get things right mm. the first time, right? I wish we, I could say we were. It's, we learn through trial and error. But if I go back to the study that I referenced in the trajectory of 2025, which we're pretty much yeah. there, and seeing a 150% or tenfold increase in overdose deaths, we got to do something different, right? Because what's, what we're doing right now is not necessarily working comprehensively, mm -hmm. right? So 
we've got to do something. And so thinking through as a system, this is a dynamic process. We learn through trial and error. And Gordon, you're exactly right. It, the tools like this should be used to reassess our progress because we're going to get better at things. So we're going to, if you will, score better. Right, right. <laughs> and then we can move on to next things, right? And so it's, it's that continual kind of improvement process, if you will, on how we're working together as mm -hmm. a system and getting those system outcomes because what we're on the wrong path mm -hmm. right now. But we're getting better. Our drug policies are getting better. I mentioned the, 20, the Mainstream Addiction Act of 2023. We're hopefully working through law enforcement and the DEA and what's coming into the country. I think we have a lot to do there. But again, getting all of those players at the table together to talk about it and think through where our resources are, where our duplications are, and where can we reallocate resources, and where can we work together better. And just to end it on a, a practical note, and I know we're, we're coming up to time here. So there's yeah. different systems level, and just to get clarification, systems level can be really, really, really big or maybe a little bit smaller. So systems yep. level, we know like there's federal policy, state policy, maybe even more mm -hmm. local level policies as well. So is there value in like having coalitions at different level and then this tool still being applicable no matter what level of a coalition and influence Absolutely. that you have? Yep. You could use a, a tool like this at any level, whether it's at local, state, or federal. Um, you can, the way that this tool is designed, you can use it definitely at, at different levels of coalitions. Yeah, absolutely. You just have to bring it into context of, of what you're trying to do and who's right. at the table. The opioid crisis has brought immeasurable suffering and devastation to countless individuals and communities across the United States and other countries as well. Now, these statistics speak for themselves, where approximately 115 people die every day in the United States from an opioid overdose, amounting to more than 400,000 deaths in the last two decades alone. And more than 2 million people are currently living with an opioid-related substance use disorder. And with all of this being said, we must never forget that there's a story behind every single number. I did want to yeah, end by it. just kind of bringing it back to, to why I do this why work. Why do you do this work, Jen? So I do this work not only just in my profession. We've talked a lot about statistics. You know, 130 folks a day are overdosing. We have so many people, millions and millions of, of people addicted with substance use disorders. So I just want us to think about this. We talk about statistics. We use data all of the time. And I want just folks to keep in mind that we do this work because there are statistics out there and every statistic is a person and every person has a story. And so when we think about it in that regard, I'm gonna tell you two statistics. One statistics was an overdose in 2004 and her name was Tiffany Parker. And she was a medical doctor. She was amazing. She loved her patients. She cared about her patients. She was a, a mother. She was a wife. She was a sister. She was a daughter. But she had chronic pain, right? She had endometriosis. She'd gone through some situations in her life, losing a daughter, so forth and so on, right? That led up to her, her using opioids. And she overdosed in 2004. And then another statistic is 2009, was Camille Bennett, who she was a teacher. She loved her students. She taught uh, fourth and sixth grade for, I'll just say many, many years, Gordon. <laughs> many, many years. She was a decorated award teacher. Her students loved her. She was a wife, a mother, and a daughter, and very well, very well respected in her community. Well, Tiffany, who died in 2004, was my sister, and in 2009, Camille was my mother. So we all have a statistic. We all know somebody who has, who has experienced some way in, these, in this overdose epidemic, and they all have a story. So I just want to end with that, that a lot of us do this work not because it's our job and we get paid to, but because we have passion. We have passion for the work and we have personal experiences that, that really impact us and want to make communities and lives better. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks yeah. for being vulnerable and sharing that. I'm glad we finished with that because it puts into perspective. We talk about you've always known public health and now you 
criminal justice and like you're doing it still and you're you're talking about that study that you referenced and it terrifies you and it kind of makes sense because you're very personally connected to it and oh my goodness and unfortunately most of us are wow yeah all of us most of us have a story like that my word I just appreciate you guys and what you're doing and just getting a lot of this information out. I mean, that's the biggest start, right? Absolutely. And the way that we can, you know, get awareness to the epidemic and be able to make change, make policy, make practice change. So thank you both for what you are doing. It's amazing. And goes without saying thank you as well. We need yeah, more people you. like you in the world doing this amazing stuff. Right back oh. at you. <laughs> This show was edited by me, Gordon Thane, with additional editing from LaShawn Benedict. Sound design and mixing by myself and LaShawn Benedict. The original music from The Music Room, composed by Tom Fox, licensed from Johnny Harris. The cover art design for our show by LaShawn Benedict. The Public Health Insight Podcast is produced by PHI Media. Thank you for listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast your go-to space for informative conversations, inspiring community action. If you enjoy our podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. See you in the next one.